king. Good afternoon. I am Dennis Galecki and welcome to the 393rd Imagine Buffalo program and another great virtual Imagine lecture hosted by the Buffalo and Erie County Public Library. Thank you so much for joining us today. This program is created by the ImagineLifelongLearning.com and Center for the Study of Art and Architecture, History and Nature. Now we're going to start with our speaker shortly, but first a little housekeeping. Everyone watching will be muted during our speaker's presentation, which will last about 15 minutes or so. We'll have time for questions at the end. If you do have a question, please type it into the chat box and we'll get to as many as we can. This program is being recorded You'll be able to watch it again later on the library's Facebook and YouTube channel pages. As a reminder, we'll be here on Zoom every Tuesday at 12.30 p.m. with a great lineup of local speakers. Today is the fifth Tuesday of the month, happens four times a year, when we focus on the art of investing. We have two primary themes in the Imagine series. This today's will address the theme to imagine a healthy, wealthy, and sustainable community. Now, if we do that, then we have to imagine place-based lifelong learning. Today's featured speaker is John D. Hartman. J.D. Hartman uh, of Signity Financial focuses on sustainable, responsible investing and provides forward-thinking financial strategies in line with client values. Founder and managing partner J.D. Hartman has worked in the financial industry for nearly 40 years, including uh, in New York City as the senior managing director of the Wall Street investment firm Liebenthal & Company. In addition to his business responsibilities, J.D. is a community activist and leader with expertise in cooperatively owned businesses. He is past chair of the Lexington Food Co-op and current board chair of Urban Roots Cooperative Garden Center in the Five Points neighborhood of Buffalo. He is also a founding member of the Sustainable Investment Forum and the Sustainable Business Roundtable. Now let's welcome J.D. Hartman. John? There, thank you, Dennis. And thanks everyone for joining. I, I really appreciate it. You know, in the time of COVID, it's not often that I get to, um, you know, gather with a group of people, even in virtual space, it, it feels good. So thanks again, Dennis and all uh, in attendance. Um, yeah, real quickly, I um, moved to New York City uh, out of college, didn't know anybody and, you know, didn't even go to, I went to school in Colorado. So it's not even like I had a, a degree that had much meaning in the New York City area. And I went to work on Wall Street. My, my, my claim to fame is that my first work address was literally 40 Wall Street. So I literally worked on Wall Street and I figuratively worked on the street for a better part of two decades. When I moved back to my uh, hometown of Buffalo, I'm a Buffalo guy, I grew up on Hodge over, you know, just uh, west of Delaware. And um, what I started to do when I came back is build my uh, company, Signity Financial, in alignment with a, a venerable financial services firm, Equitable. And I've done that with uh, partners. I'm gonna introduce a partner uh, in a minute or two, uh, Mateo Escobar. Um, but, you know, I, I do wanna say that as we present today, there, there, and we throw around a few acronyms and it's kind of a no-no in presentations. The, the acronym ESG, you may all know, um, stands for environmental, social justice, and open and fair governance. It's another acronym, SRI, and that's uh, socially responsible or sustainably responsible investing. And then there's just RI, responsible investing. And then there's impact investing. They're all, for today, there's subtle differences. For today, we're gonna, they're gonna be used interchangeably. Okay, and it basically is, Dennis mentioned in his introduction, refers to 
aligning our investments with our universally admired values around equity, equitable, fairness, inclusion, diversity, care and nurturing of our environment. Uh, you know, before I give the impression that somehow, you know, I'm a, a, you know, a bleeding heart liberal, a tree hugger, a crunchy granola guy, I'm all of those things. But I also, you know, came of age as a, as a, a young adult and then my, you know, uh, formative years up to almost 50 years old working on Wall Street. I am all about taking care of our clients and their financial safety through optimizing returns. That's what I do. That's what I get up six days a week and, and go to work to do. Uh, but there's this new age, uh, and it's really a dawning of a new age um, where now using ESG, these are, these are risk management uh, filters around the environment, social justice and open governance is upon us. It is, it's here, it's, it's not going away. Mateo is gonna show you in his introduction and I just want to say that uh, Matteo is an extraordinary partner of mine in that uh, he is a, a, a past business first 30 under 30 recipient. He was also then a, asked to be a judge for that for the uh, four years uh, following his participation. He's the co-founder of the Westside International Soccer League with his uh, wife. Uh, he is on the Wilson Foundation Steering Committee for the uh, uh, reimagining of LaSalle Park or Wilson, you know, the Wilson Centennial Park. Uh, he, I mentioned uh, he's a husband and a father of three. I am honored to have him here. And he's going to kind of take us through ESG 101. So with that, I hope I gave you a little sense of me, both personally and professionally, and, and Mateo. And I think you're going to get a, you know, you'll get a good taste of Mateo in this portion of the presentation. So thanks a ton. Matteo, can you take it away? I can. Thank you. All right. Uh, so right now, everybody should be able to see the screen share and uh, investing for impact. Just our two, our two mugs on there, but uh, we'll move on from that. So, and I'm seeing a meeting alert to share the video. Can you guys see my screen okay? I see sustainable investing is still on the rise. Okay. So yeah, so you know, it's it's a timely topic, as you guys are very, you know most likely aware, right? It, um, it, there's increasing attention to this, and we're hoping only more increasing attention over the next uh, you know next years to come. And um, you know, just looking back all the way, and, and you can see you know even just in recent years an explosion of it, uh, but it actually accounts for one in three dollars under professional management. Now, there's a lot of greenwashing in there. We're very careful to, uh, you know, avoid those things. But the attention and the and um, the intention to make our investments more sustainable and responsible is just a is just a growing one. So, I wanted to start there as we're understanding just a little bit about the background. Now, what it is and how we engage in it. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, the familiarity of the room, but uh, really there's three major ways in which we can engage with a sustainable, responsible investment approach. Okay. The first one is an exclusionary approach. So this is where we're divesting from things we don't like. Okay? It's part of what most people think of. I want to get rid of fossil fuels. Uh, maybe they want to get rid of certain weapons. Um, you know, it was what it, originally it was based on religious values, tobacco, alcohol, things like that. Uh, but, uh, you know, it just incorporates negative screens. Okay. The second way is integration. So this is what, when people say mainstream ESG investing, this is mostly what they're talking about. It's traditional portfolio management with extra rigor and engaged ownership around the environment, social justice, and corporate governance. So think of companies like Patagonia, right? They're not reinventing uh, the, you know, uh, renewable energy, they're not reinventing the wheel on anything um, in, in that regard. What they are doing, though, is they're being a responsible company producing um, you know, uh, outerwear and, and clothing. So 
Um, so we look at those companies and we say, hey, how, you know, what companies are actively reducing their carbon footprint? What companies uh, have better board diversification? And statistically speaking, that leads to better financial returns. So that's when we ESG into the process. It's, it's uh, looking at those things and, and it's uh, enhancing our financial returns and, and risk management. But on top of that, it's an active ownership, right? So it's looking at those companies and saying, well, hey, how can we make those companies better? Um, so, can, you know, when you are own a share of a company, you actually have voting rights and you can actually influence the direction of the company. And, and uh, so when it does come time for a company to maybe make a proposal, on, hey, should we increase the CEO pay or should we uh, have a more diverse board or should we um, improve our environmental processes in, in uh, recycling? All those things are things that you as an owner and investor can impact and participate in. So the third part is what a lot of people think of, and this is specifically impact or just, you know, innovation, right? It's, it's literally the things that are disrupting and, and innovating, right? And, and, and because of that, they often have less of a track record. So, um, right, it, in order to innovate, you can't do what status quo was a year ago, 10 years ago, you know, 30 years ago, right? So it's, it's inherently um, newer, inherently less of a track record, but it's important to be forward thinking, right? And so and this would be investments in directly in clean energy or urban sustainability or electric vehicles and so on. So those are the, really the three ways we engage in it. And a lot of times it's not just, um, you know, one of those things, right? A, a lot of times people view this maybe as a spectrum and that is one way to look at it. But the other way also, you know, hey, what components, you know, what ways do we want to engage in our investments? What boxes might we want to check? Some of clients only really care about exclusion. Some of them, you know, want mainstream and you know, more mainstream ESG and corporation. And then others also want to include that innovation component. So um, all three are things that we help our clients with, but hopefully that just gave you a little bit of an overview. Um, now, what about performance, right? So we talked about, you know, we've told you that it enhances performance, but let's just do a quick comparison. S&P 500, just, so just large companies in the US, like looking at the market, when people talk about the market compared to, what if we took those, um, you know, again, the US market, but we got rid of some of the worst actors and at the same time, um, you know, in, uh, invested in some climate leaders. And what is it the result? Historically, you could see that the pink or the socially responsible ends up ahead of the non-socially responsible over here annualized returns are about a half a percent higher, almost, a little, uh, almost half a percent higher. And you can see over 30 year period of time. Not only that, but you actually cut your carbon footprint of that investment um, down to a third of what it was. So, uh, and, that, and you know, you, you can literally look up, look up these statistics. The S&P has a, you know, a, a carbon footprint three times of its equivalent socially responsible JD, now we're going to, you know, just take us, yeah. you know, to the next, next phase of the conversation is yeah. what's your walk. Thanks, Matteo. Um, before I get to this, I just want to recap the previous three slides that Matteo went through. You know, he, he talked about this movement uh, having burst on the scene in the last three years, maybe five years. Um, and, and that's a, a really positive development. I'll give you a personal story about Mm, about a year ago, early last winter, uh, a friend slash client of mine who's a, a business broker uh, called me to introduce me to his, his largest client. And here's how he started out. He said, you know, JD, when you introduced me to this concept 15 years ago, I thought you were crazy. And, now, and, now, and then he said, and now here I am introducing you to my biggest client. So this has come a long way, baby, and it's a good thing. And that's what I'm going to get to when we get to that other slide. But on the second, you know, the, the exclude, the um, uh, integrate and innovate, you know, the, 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 I think, that one, you know, this stuff works, you know, um, divestiture uh, uh, from South Africa brought down the apartheid regime, period. You can talk all you want about things, but money is really what talks and walks. So excluding works, as does integration. Uh, there was a five-year, five-year proxy battle led by the New York State Pension Fund 
and the Church of England and lots of other uh, socially responsible ESG funds that, that made Exxon uh, appoint a, uh, the first woman to their board, and it was a, 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 a world renowned climate change scientist, the ex executive director of the Woods Hole Institute. So this stuff works, this, 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 this uh, investor activism. And then innovating, everyone knows that right now, literally that solar power and wind power is uh, the, it, it basically to produce a kilowatt is the same price as uh, fossil fuels. So this stuff works. Um, and then the performance, but remember I said, our, our, our first and primary responsibility uh, in redundancy uh, intended is to our clients, to our clients financial safety. Therefore, people come to us to help them invest their money so that their return, they optimize their returns. And you can see that incorporating these ESG risk management analysis increases performance, period. So that's, I just wanted to kind of put in my two cents as the old hand here. And Mateo, if you'd go to the next slide, I also would be a little bit remiss if I didn't talk about, look, I, I don't know if anyone saw my uh, Another Voice column back, I think in June of this year uh, in the Buffalo News. I am a big believer in capitalism. I came of age working in the bowels of capitalism on Wall Street. I think the only way that we can solve the world's problem is through capitalism, okay? But it needs to be redirected. It needs to be redirected. This is a picture of child labor in a cobalt mine in Central Africa, the country of Uganda. These young boys are working, okay? I just use this, but you know, I could use a photo of the proliferation of plastic in our oceans. I could use, uh, you know, a photo of the, you know, uh, chemical crescent down in the, you know, southeast of the United States. You know, I could use a, uh, a photo of, of slave labor on commercial fishing fleets in the South China Sea. And and, and I can go on and on and on. This is happening and it's not just happening somewhere else in the world where, where it kind of trickles down to or, or we are above and feeding it with our capital is through our Vanguard funds, our Fidelity funds, our iShares. That there's, look, I, I, I'm not casting any stones from a glass house. I, I work in this industry, but they do not take into consideration the social carnage from our investments that also reduces their performance. So what we're talking about here is a win, win, win. We align our investments with our values and we and our fellows will be more secure. There are other ways to mine cobalt. Matter of fact, we are so ingenious Humankind is so ingenious, we can find an alternative to cobalt. We flew to the moon 50 years ago. I have a phone in my hand that is a macro computer that has over a hundred times the technology in it than the entire Apollo space program had. We, we need to innovate, we need to integrate, and we need to exclude some bad players and start moving forward. We need to take control. We own these companies, the executives, they, it's not their piggy bank. When you own a stock, whether it's through a mutual fund or an ETF or whatever it is, you are an owner of that company. I believe we have a responsibility to act, not virtuously, but the best we can, because this is a gray area. There's no perfect. But anyway, that's kind of my soapbox around this. I am passionate about this. I have committed my entire professional life to my clients' social financial safety in the last 15 to 17 years to incorporating ESG or socially responsible investing into folks' financial lives. So anyway, that's about it, Dennis. I'd love to answer some questions. I hope some people have are willing to challenge me on some of the facts or, or if they have some, you know, they're curious and they just want to make a statement, I would love to hear from you folks. So thank you again, Dennis and everyone. 
Good, JD. Uh, Melissa, do we have any questions from the chat room? Yes, we have a few. Let's hear um, So the first question is from Hal. How does divestment work? If I divest from extractive companies, I must sell my shares in those companies. For me to sell, someone else must buy those shares from me. So what have I achieved by changing ownership? Yeah, that, that, that's, a, that's a challenging one. You're, you're right because you know, there's always, I mean, there's no market with a, without a, uh, a buyer for the seller or the seller for the buyer. So um, you're right there. But what, what has happened, for example, in the fossil fuel industry, these, these companies that are actually in the business of extracting and burning fossil fuels, uh, they're, they're, for the last 10 years, they're down almost 4% when the market is up almost 100%. So but when you, you, you sell, someone buys it, guess what? If they held it for a year, they lost money. So the cost of capital for the Exxons and the Shells and the, you know, those companies has gone up. And it's, it's punitive. They're starting to change. <laughs> they, they get it. The only thing they understand is money. It doesn't make them bad people. And, and so anyway, I don't know if that answers your question, but what it does is the price of those price of those stocks have been trending down while the market has been trending up and it increases their cost of capital. Not, not for any, really, we're not punishing them. It's just bad business. Their, their reserves, so their assets in, their ground, in the ground, they have priced at $107 a barrel. <laughs> That's on their balance sheet. You know what it's trading at right now? 49. It's a bad investment. Forget ESG. Bad in investment. Forget my values. JD. Yes. JD, the, the other dimension of that uh, isn't so much the, uh, is along with what you said, but it's also the, the values of the holder. Uh, that's really what you're, what I hear you trying to link is to say, uh, uh, we're not changing the world. We're just trying to align uh, our clients, your investors, with uh, what they believe in. And seeing Correct. if there's a way to connect that with companies that have similar values. Uh, and we're just starting to measure that. ESG yes. ratings, the new phenomena where you get objective and uh, no guarantees. Maybe you'll do better, maybe you'll do worse. But at least you'll sense that your investment, which in effect is how the world works, we make things work by investing in them, yes. uh, is aligned with your values. And you are providing the service of having helping create that discussion uh that's 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 really at the heart of it not changing yes. the world helping change individuals yep i i concur 100 percent. although i would say it's it's changing the world too it is changing the what, world <laughs> but but it's primarily our because it's our clients and it's aligning their yeah. investments with their values you're you're you're, you're 99 percent of correct and reading my mind, but it's also, I am into changing the world. Well, and, and changing it one investor at a time. Is you got it. Yeah, you're right, dude. I, I'm, I'm the kind of guy who like takes care of the stop sign at my corner first, you know. There you go. <laughs> and the other thing are so many not-for-profits. Uh, they have money to invest mm. uh, in their, you know, pension plans and whatnot. And, and to start to aligning their values with the world that we're living in and this awareness that's uh, to me the market that I was exploring back in the 1980s. So, um, uh, and retired from. So, yeah. uh, I, I have great empathy for what you're doing, and and uh, that's the reason you're here speaking today. <laughs> Next question. Anything else, Melissa? Yes, we have three more questions. Um, so, first question from Bob: Are there any particular segments within the sustainable or responsible companies? that will benefit from the upcoming Biden administration? Yes. Um, the renewable or alternative energy sector will explode. And it's gonna be, a, it, it's a good thing. The, the woman that he appointed to one of the top environmental post is the ex-governor of Michigan. She's been running the think tank at Berkeley, Cal Berkeley. I saw her speak at uh, Canisius College a few years ago. And her whole thing is, is, look, job creation is in the alternative 
energy uh, sector, not in the, you know, the, the fossil fuels. It, look, it, it's like, it's like investing in buggy whips, you know, like, dude, it's over. <laughs> it's going to take a while, but it's over. So that's one area. The other area, interesting enough, that's a good question is the entire sector will benefit because uh, the Obama administration was about to allow uh, ESG investment options into 401ks. Of course, our current administration put the kibosh on that. And already there's a bill uh, percolating in Congress to, to, reintroduce that so so more capital will be flowing to investments that all investments whether it's in cars you know electric cars or alternative energy sources and that type of thing next question from scott should big tech companies without a large carbon footprint for instance facebook or microsoft mm -hmm. be more evaluated on their social justice and governance efforts or should all three parts of ESG be evaluated equally? Yeah, that's that, that's someone who knows what they're talking about, and I appreciate it. Um, yeah, because it, you know, it's it. Yeah, like Apple, Google, you know, the Fang stocks, the Facebooks, and Netflix are doing a great job in the uh, environmental component of ESG analysis. I mean, literally, they're investing heavily in, in alternative energy, and some of them are already achieving zero carbon footprint, that type of thing. But social, just, you know, the social aspect of it, and even the governance, you know, they're, they're you know, it's still dominated by white males. It just is. I mean, you've read it. And so, so and, and then, uh, you know, the, the social justice, like, hey, what about their, you know, supply chain? Like, Apple doesn't even know, for example, where their screens are being made. Not the screen itself, but the, the components of the screen over in Southeast Asia. So, um, yes, they need to be heavily scrutinized. Look, big data is in this. You know, Mateo showed a, a you know, one out of every three dollars. There are trillions of dollars invested in it. And big data is there. We subscribe to Sustainalytics, uh, Morningstar. So we, it, yes. So S and G is more important in the big tech. Right. And then the last question, kind of pivoting away from from this topic, um, from Catherine, there is a local organic farm that the Lexington Co-op is supporting this week. What else can we do as a community to support this farm? Yeah, you know, <laughs> getting close to, you're getting dear to my heart. I mean, like when I think of the co-op, I, I, I I'm a sap. I, it brings tears to my eyes. Do you know that almost 20,000 people in Buffalo own the Lexington Food Co-op. It does over $25 million in sale, 55 cents on every dollar is spent locally. It employs, we never took any government assistance. Um, look, I was the chair when we went from the small uh, corner store on Lexington and Ashland up and bought that piece of property on a spec and developed the, the, the store in Elmwood and it, it so what can we do? I, I think, you know what? Shop at the co-op. 55% of your money goes to the local growers, that specific farm. I'm not sure which one you're talking about, but if it's out there, the co-op will source it and they will, they, they, here's how powerful it is. We sign purchase orders. So they have money they can go to their bank with and, and borrow money to, to plant their crops next year. It, it is, and it's same things going on now down, is, you know, I'm the chair of the, of Urban Roots. Uh, in the garden center it, you know there are over 1400 of us that own that so uh I, i'm look there's lots of forms of ownership private companies all for them love it and then there's public companies whether it's exxon apple or you know m t bank and then there's this another business a form of, of business ownership called cooperatives huge in the real estate market in new york city something like you know 20 percent of the real estate's owned cooperative so this isn't crazy stuff. I'm not a crazy man. <laughs> I'm, I'm a, I'm a red-blooded American who's a believer in capitalism. That, that, that does it, I'm not looking for more government regulation. I'm looking for shareholders, mutual fund owners to take responsibility for themselves and align their investments with their values. That's what we do so that they're more secure that they, my clients are more financially secure. That's, that, is my, that is my pledge. 
That's what, as a fiduciary, that's what I have to do. When I get up in the morning, I, I, Dennis is right. I'm not thinking about saving the world. I'm thinking about putting my, my, my client's financial safety first and foremost. So anyway, can I get going or what? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's it. So, Melissa, does that wrap up the questions? Yes, those were all the questions that we had. Hey, Dennis, people are welcome to call me. I can, if they, you know, I would just to warn them to, to set aside some time because I am a talker, but I would love to hear from anybody. And same with uh, Matteo. He's, uh, he runs our planning uh, team. He also heads our risk management, you know, around um, uh, long-term care and, and, and uh, those type of risks that people encounter along the way. So you can call either one of us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, give that phone number real quick. Sure, my direct is 474-4623. 474-4623. And Mateo's is 536-0944. And once again, thanks everybody. Thank you, Jan, Mateo, uh, both. Uh, this, uh, this fifth uh, Tuesday Art of Investing was designed to connect with a class that I've been presenting for the uh, last dozen years at Chautauqua every Monday at their um, library, right at, uh, in the middle. It's um, accessible and free to anybody that wants to just come to the class. Uh, there's no uh, uh, fees to get in the gate uh, for the library. Uh, so that's on Mondays, typically at four o'clock. Uh, hopefully this coming summer, we'll uh, get back to a live presentation. And uh, I record all of that. You can go to Chuck Lacusa's website, buffaloah.com, and you'll see uh, the center and the art of investing. And you can listen to those recordings for uh, since uh, 2010. Uh, if you want to uh, hear uh, thoughts that I try to develop uh, and, and listen to the people that go to Chautauqua, and have quite a bit of experience. And I simply try to share that under the theme, the art of investing. So uh, thank you folks for joining us today. Uh, our last uh, uh, program of 2020. Join us next week, Tuesday and next year, same time, same Zoom link when we uh, talk with and hear from Lucy Connery, uh, the executive director of the Wellness Institute of Greater Buffalo and Western New York. I'm Dennis Galecki. Be well, have a good day, and have a happy new year. <laughs>